Hi, I'm Andrew Scott and I'm here with Linda Gratton to talk about our book we've just finished, The Hundred Year Life. Both Linda and I spend our time focusing and researching on the big forces that are going to transform the world around us. And we both feel that longevity, the fact that we are living for longer, is something that's going to absolutely lead to a redefinition and a rethink of how we need to do things both individually, corporate level and governments, educational institutions, every facet of society. We also feel it's something that very little thought is being given to at the moment. People aren't really focusing on the redesign aspect. They're not aware of all the issues, which is why we wrote this book. The key challenge is, is that people are living for longer. Half the children born in the West today will comfortably live to be more than 100 years of age. And this isn't some wacky, wild science fiction story. This is really happening. And it's happening to all of us. Each of us, on average, has a life expectancy 10 years longer than our parents. Our children will live 10 years longer than us. And we have to think about what we do with that time. Now, a lot of the focus has just been on finance. And of course, to finance a long life, we have to work for longer and save for more. But there's so much more that's involved. This is about having a lot more time. And we need to think about how to use that time appropriately. And of course, time is the very structure of everything we do in society. And we have to change that structure, change how we divide our life and our years and our careers. So what does it mean for the individual, for each one of us? Well, to help us to understand that, we, we created three personas. One of them who uh, is currently 70 and will probably pass away quite soon is called Jack. One is Jimmy and he's in his 40s and one is Jane who's in her 20s. And what we did was we sort of played out their lives both in terms of uh, how they're going to manage their finances, what you might call their tangible assets, but also how they're going to manage the rather more intangible part of their life. What became really clear is that for Jack, the three-stage life works really well. Now, what is the three-stage life? Well, it's simply education, work, retirement. And if you look at Jack's life, pretty much everybody at the same age went in from education to work and from work to retirement. You can think about that as lockstep. Is that going to work for Jimmy? Well, Jimmy's now 40, maybe you're 40, and Jimmy's already realising that he's going to have to work a lot longer than he thought he would. How's he going to make that happen? Well, he could put his head firmly in the sand and deny it and probably, you know, retire in his 60s at a, on a pretty low pension. Or he could do something about that right now. He could actually, uh, you know, really build his intangible assets. He could learn new skills. He could perhaps become an entrepreneur. He could perhaps change his relationship at home so he and his wife work differently together. Uh, and so he's got some really important challenges. But Jane, in a way, has got the greatest opportunities, but also has to think most about her life. Jane's now 20. Is she going to jump straight into work or is she going to be uh, an explorer, finding out more about herself? One of the things that Andrew and I realised about the 100-year life is that 100 years allows you to make a lot more choices. It gives you a lot more options, you can make more choices. And how you actually think about those options becomes really important. So it's no surprise to us that, for example, young people are already uh, uh, getting married later. They're already uh, settling, buying a house later. They want to have a look at their choices and options. So we think that Jane will have a life which is far removed from the three stages. In fact, when we actually began to look at the scenarios, we thought she could have four, five, six stages even. What does that mean for Jane? Well, certainly across her life, she's got to learn how to build her intangible assets, you know, her assets of productivity, uh, her assets of vitality. We see health being a lot more important. But perhaps most importantly, Jane has got to learn to change. She's got to learn to make transitions from one time to another. Now, what does that mean for corporations? Well, imagine you're employing 
hundreds of Janes, thousands of Janes. First thing, there's not going to be lockstep anymore. So you can't treat Jane the same as everybody else who's the same age as her. Age is no longer a way of thinking about stage. And so we think that corporations are going to have to be much more individual about their relationship with their employees. But it's not just that. You know, when we try to work out the finances of a long life, what became very clear to us is a dual career where both people work is a much more sustainable economic model than Jack's traditional model where he worked and his wife stayed at home. But of course, managing dual careers is a lot trickier than managing uh, one person working and one staying at home, and how do corporations come to terms with that? Particularly when more and more men also want to play active roles with their children. So lockstep ends, dual careers also begin to change. And then, of course, there's the whole question of how does Jane sustain herself in terms of her education and learning? And clearly, you know, we as academics have sabbaticals, but surely Jane is going to need sabbaticals. Surely Jane is also going to have to take time out. So we think that corporations are going to have to fundamentally th reimagine the relationship that they have with their employees. So of course, when everything changes, when we redesign life, everyone's affected. So it's not just individuals and companies, but educational institutions are going to have to change enormously. And the very nature of what they do and who they are is going to have to shift. Linda and I are both professors. We focus on this sector a lot. And there's lots of concerns about how technology will change it. But longevity is going to have an enormous impact. The good news is if we're living for longer, we're going to use some of that time to get more education. That's the really good news. But of course, what that education is, when we do it, what form it takes and how it's credentialized is going to change beyond recognition. Right now, undergraduates, you roughly know how old they are, they get a skill base, and that's intended to last them throughout their career. If you've got a 60-year career, there is no knowledge that you can learn at age 20 that can survive that length of time. So education will cease to be a big investment up front. It's going to have to be spread right the way through careers. If age is no longer stage, then undergraduates are going to be a variety of experiences in a variety of different ages. And then what do you teach people? Do you teach them flexible thinking that they can then use throughout their career and then specialist skills that need to be updated every 10, 20 years? And is it really universities will play this role here or will education have to be much closer linked to people's jobs and careers as they change and shift what they're doing later in life? Every aspect will need to change. How we teach, what we teach, and when we teach. And I think the institutions delivering that education will shift as well. And of course, the government. The government designed the rules of the game. And if we're changing how we live our life, those rules are going to have to change an awful lot. The government has a massive agenda. They're obviously going to behave slowly, so it's going to be up to you, first of all, to seize the initiative. But governments are going to have to do a great deal. There's so much for them to do. The first is they need to be a bit more honest about what is happening to life expectancy. It's a technical issue like measuring life expectancy, but they're still using measures that assume that children born today have my life expectancy, ignoring all the public health and technology breakthroughs that mean they will live for longer. So we have to start using the better estimates of life expectancy that build in those factors. And then inequality. There are enormous inequalities in health and life expectancy. It's not everyone who will benefit from this. You can see big differences between those who are poor and those who are well off. And of course, those with the resources and the education, they can be flexible in their lifestyle, but that may not be an option open to others. So governments have to work really hard to tackle this inequality. To date, governments have been obsessed with aging and health, the final stage of life. But if we're redesigning life, they're gonna to have to unpick so much of the legislation. For instance, if you look at the statistics on labour uh, force, under 16 you're a child, 64 you become retired. That three-stage life is exemplified in those cut-off points. Certain ages have an importance that will no longer be relevant. And as individuals choose different life paths and they have more options, and as each individual chooses a different route, governments are going to have to enable that flexibility. Much more of a shift towards lifetime allowances rather than cut 
to particular ages and say, this is the age when you can take this option or not that option. Governments have to make enormous changes. Not just finances, not just work, relationships. Our concepts of marriage, um, four generation households, what are our obligations to each other across that? All of that's going to have to be recognised in the law. So every aspect of society is going to have to be backed up by a changing legislation. And governments really need to act now if they're going to enable us to make the best use of this additional time. It's an enormous agenda. And are governments and corporations going to act now? Well, our view is they probably won't. Our view is there's a lot of inertia in the system. And actually, governments and corporations are going to be operating in catch-up for a lot of time. So where are the changes going to happen? Well, they're going to happen with you and I. They're going to happen at the level of the family, in your communities, and indeed, uh, perhaps in, in, your, in your, the, your work teams. We think that we're moving into an era of extreme experimentation, where each person, each family, each work group struggles with making this a gift and tries very hard to make sure that this isn't a curse. We wrote the book about how we think a hundred years will develop and the sort of challenges that we thought will, will occur. But what we didn't completely understand was the sort of experiments that you are going to do. And that's why on our website, we invite you to come on in and tell us about those experiments. We think that this is a huge challenge and we'd like the public discourse to be much greater than it is now. Thank you.